So, technique-wise, we are ready. Please um, find your seat again, and we can start with the second lecture. <laughs> okay, shall I just start? Okay, I'll start anyway. Um, so, yes, speculative resourcefulness is the title of my talk. And um, before I start, I would like to thank Vera, of course, for organizing such an unprecedentedly interdisciplinary conference. Um, thank you to Amanda, who's taking a coffee now, for setting the standard for eloquence. I think I will never uh, meet that standard, but I'll try. And um, what I also want to say um, uh, before I start is that I think that Georg, you performed in your introduction to this panel uh, what I will be talking about today in terms of uh, the reading together of multiple sources and in terms of arguing that science, humanities, art, dreams all contain reason, truth, logicity, as well as feeling, falsity, and illogicity, um, all of it. Always. So I think your, uh, your introduction was perfect for uh, what I want to do. So I hope to interest some of you in um, thinking with me and in maybe also designing with me. Um, I left a quite clumsy slide in this presentation and with the PowerPoint you never really know uh, where you're going to end up. Uh, but uh, should I show it and should you have ideas for like making it better? Um, let me know. Please approach me over lunch, and um, uh, if you have the time, uh, we can talk about it. So, um, yes, analysis as non-exhaustive, and a proposal for a speculative turn in the philosophy of science and uh, humanities. That is uh, what I want to talk about, and I will um, uh, kind of... Um, center my argument around uh, a figure, an American philosopher, a woman, Suzanne Langer. Uh, she has said something uh, in the 40s and the 50s that uh, has kept me busy for a while and um, that I want to, um, yeah, that I've wanted to, to speak meaningfully about and that I wanted to come to understand. Um, and uh, I can immediately show you what it is. Um, I can read a few quotes. So Suzanne Langer, born in 1895, and she died in 19, um, 19, she was born in 1895, and she, was, she died in 1985. Um, so she said a few things in um, two of her books, Feeling and Form and Philosophy in the New Key. So Feeling and Form, she said the following. Despite all shortcomings, blind leads, or mistakes that they may see in each other's doctrines, I believe that Bell, Fry, Bergson, Grotje, Bange, Collingwood, Cassirer, and I, not to forget such literary critics as Barfield and Day Lewis and others too, whom I have not named and perhaps not even read, have been and are really engaged on one philosophical project. And earlier in that book, she says that the literature behind us, known or unknown to any particular thinker, uh, exists and has uh, informed her writing. In an earlier book, Philosophy in a New Key, she said that inevitably the philosophical ideas of every thinker stem from all he has read and as well as, well as all he has heard and seen. And he, of course, um, yeah, as a reminder of the fact that she wrote this in the 40s. And she said that while writing the book, quotations could be multiplied almost indefinitely. So, I, first of all, I, was, I started reading Suzanne Langer because uh, I had read in a footnote of a student paper that uh, Langer was um, influenced by Whitehead and Cassirer. And I found that quite striking. I was like two very different figures in the history of philosophy have influenced this one woman. So uh, what is she writing and, and what is the philosophy of art that comes out? When I started reading her, her two uh, books on uh, the philosophy of art, and of course after these books she has produced more, um, I read that you know, her, the, the way she thinks about influence is, uh, is, is even more 
kind of interesting and, and perverse and, and multiplicitous than just Whitehead and uh, Kassira. So how can we actually understand uh, what she's saying here? How can you be influenced by everything you've ever read, heard, seen, uh, even by literature that you're not aware of? Um, and uh, interestingly, the secondary literature on Suzanne Langer doesn't pay attention to this uh, very multiplicitous take on uh, philosophy, on bibliography at all. So uh, there's two important uh, kind of um, yeah, overviews uh, have been published on Suzanne Langer. One was published in 2009 uh, by a scholar called Robert Innes, and he writes about Langer as an American semiotician or pragmatist, and he, uh, he simply argues that Pierce, James, and Dewey have uh, been her main uh, interlocutors. And of course, this is an important move that he makes. I mean, he says that, you know, look, here's this woman that we don't read anymore, uh, and we should, like, include her to a particular philosophical canon, like take her as seriously as Pierce, James, and Dewey. Uh, fine enough, fair enough. Uh, important enough, but it is not quite what Suzanne Langer is doing, I think. And yesterday I started reading uh, the latest um, like overview of Langer's uh, philosophy. And uh, here, um, it, it, the book, I mean, the, I have it in my bag, but it, it says that it's been published in 2020. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Um, here, Langer is read as someone that should be um, uh, like understood with the logician Schaeffer, with Kassirer and Whitehead, and with uh, Wittgenstein. So again, you know what what you see here is a more eclectic list. Uh, again, uh, all men, but I think it doesn't do, do justice at all to uh, what Suzanne Langer herself is uh, talking about. Like she she would be maybe amazed by this list or uninterested, or I don't know how she would, how she would respond. So how can we understand something like this, um, being influenced by such a wide uh, variety, an unlimited uh, variety of um, thinkers, and not, not just philosophers. I mean, these people are also journalists, art critics, uh, but it could also be like a leaf falling off the tree, um, something she's seen, you know, or a sound. So how to theorize Suzanne Langer's take on project, philosophical project, the one philosophical project that all of these people are and things are contributing to, and how to talk about her bibliography. And I think today um, a project like this is becoming more and more uh, interesting and important. Uh, I think we're all teachers, we're all dissertation advisors, um, we have undergraduate students, we have nieces, we have um, like lots of young people in our lives and uh, we know that, you know, they have access to this wide variety of sources that Suzanne Langer was talking about in the 40s and 50s. Uh, we have mobile phones, we talked about it yesterday, we create all kinds of narratives, um, we find sources, uh, you know, we receive them, um, but at the same time, uh, with our digital devices, it's, it's also, yeah, it's, it's uh, because of the temporal element, uh, it may be harder to, um, yeah, actually talk about them. Um, it may be easier to talk about this kind of uh, condition we're in uh, by reflecting on Suzanne Langer who was not living in this uh, digital era, in this algorithmic condition, uh, but uh, she was writing in the 40s and 50s. At the same time, her, uh, all of her writing is full of this kind of flowing uh, of uh, texts and images uh, and things. Um, so for example, in an interview, or it's not really an interview, it's like a profile sketch uh, that was published in The New Yorker, uh, she says this, she says, in my early teens, I read Little Women and Kant's Critique of Pure Reason simultaneously. Um, so she says this in the 60s, thinking about her 
uh, yeah, upbringing and, and the way in which uh, she, she engaged as a, as a young girl with uh, literature. So it's striking that she read Kant. It's great that she read, read Little Women, but the fact that she uh, read them together uh, and that she finds this uh, meaningful, I think, uh, is interesting and um, uh, is something for us to, to reflect on. Um, yes, so how to do this? Um, I've tried out many, many different ways of uh, approaching this, um, this problem, and uh, for this conference, uh, I decided to focus on, um, yeah, to, to take just one angle, one possible angle, and um, the angle is, uh, consists of a, what I call, diffractive reading, so a reading through one another of two of Langer's own texts. Um, you will see on the left, you will see a, an article that she published in 1933. It's an article on facts um, that she wrote um, while in the time of logical positivism becoming the Vienna Circle, uh, becoming more and more um, present in, in, uh, on the philosophical landscape. Um, they've, they had moved to uh, the US already, or they were in the process of moving uh, because of um, racial politics. And then there is the other uh, source, uh, a 1958 book, uh, Reflections on Art. Now, finally, I found my, uh, my own copy. That's a library copy. Um, a source book of writings by artists, critics, and philosophers in which uh, she not only brings together uh, some of these uh, philosoph philosophical and journalistic uh, texts on art that she wants other people to also write, uh, but she also writes uh, or wrote uh, an interesting introduction to um, that book uh, that I will use um, and read through the text on facts. So uh, the text on facts is very much a reflection on philosophy of science, and the text uh, from Reflections on Art is very much a text that discusses uh, reflection on art. But they have a similar project, and I guess, uh, you know, reading these two texts uh, together kind of performs uh, what I think uh, Suzanne Langer is doing herself. Um, yes, so um, I have brought together on my slides um, several quotes, and um, I will not read all of those quotes, uh, but I will talk a little bit to uh, these quotes and um, let them, um, yeah, uh, let allow you and myself also to, to kind of like also read bits and pieces of the quotes uh, simultaneously or afterwards. So one of the things that, uh, and a diffractive reading is a reading that reads texts through one another, texts that do not necessarily have something to do, uh, something to do with one another because maybe they have a different project or something. But what diffractive, uh, diffractive reading wants to um, produce is uh, a reflection on the similarities and differences uh, between the sources, but especially um, thinking about uh, what uh, these two sources produce together. So um, one of the things that both texts, um, so new, new conceptualization you could say, so one of, the, one of the, the topics that both texts discusses is a critique, it is a critique of philosophy of science as a philosophy of physics. So Langer criticizes uh, in the 1933 text, but also in the text uh, from Reflections on Art, she criticizes the narrowing down of philosophy into uh, a theory of knowledge. So she argues that philosophy has become very much a theory of knowledge. And she ar also argues that philosophy of science has been narrowed down to philosophy of physics. So she says that, but she's, she's not only critical, uh, she also says that philosophy of science is still um, in the making, which means it's, it's transforming, it's self-transforming. 
um, and that makes her less critical about uh, philosophy of science or about the questions that this field um, asks. Um, so she says that the interaction of philosophy of physics with its wider intellectual environment will lead to, to a transformation of both philosophy of physics and its intellectual environment. And this belief in transformation per se is a fundamental belief held by Langer, who already in 1933, and uh, in a piece on the seemingly narrow topics, uh, topic of facts and empiricism, argues that it is false to assume that a complete analysis exhausts analytical possibilities. Um, so whereas this may seem to be the case, um, uh, actual analysis never exhausts analytical possibilities. That is uh, what, she, what she argues. So you may, you may think that your analysis is exhaustive of, uh, is, is the best analysis, is the most convincing analysis, it's the final analysis of something. Um, for Langer, um, it, that's not at all the case. Uh, there is never an exhausting uh, of possibilities. So an analysis is the, just that. It is one analysis and it is not um, exhaustive. Um, yes, so she critiques the philosophy of science for a narrowing down, a movement of narrowing down, and uh, also a belief in the fact that narrowing down is, is a good thing. Um, but she says, okay, on the other hand, you know, any narrowing down uh, will still produce um, other analytical um, options. So um, here you say for, see, for example, uh, the second bullet point. May it not be, oh, here, no, 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 sorry. Um, the spectacle where, what was I going to point at? Um, nothing, so I have to, there's two slides on my, uh, on, my, on my screen here, whatever, forget it. Yes, so that is what she's saying about, uh, she critiques the philosophy of science, but at the same time she's creative with it because she says there is never a, uh, an exhaustion of, possi of analytical possibilities happening. She also talks about truth and falsity. So according to Langer, you may think that she is critical of facts, of factual statements, but Langer says, there is nothing wrong with a fact. A fact is simply that. This is the case here and now. Um, and she says that actually we should, or she suggests that we should provide uh, facts with time and space coordinates because the, these coordinates make that facts will remain true. So, and according to Langer, this is how we should talk about facts. Facts have very discrete, distinct, time, temporal and spatial coordinates. They will remain true uh, when we just provide these coordinates with uh, the fact. But she says we should talk differently about events. Events happen in duration, and they should in fact get durational coordinates that is at all possible. So she is interested in the logical structure of facts. They have the propositional form of entities in relation, simply subject predicate structures. Um, but she's also interested in events. Um, she says that we use concepts even for the construction of factual sentences, but more importantly or more interestingly, concepts have to be able to also carry the durational, that is, the transformational nature of events. Concepts must be strong enough to carry the difficulties, paradoxes, mysteries, not of facts, but of that which transforms. We can say, for example, that Virginia Woolf's sister painted a certain piece in a certain year but that, that does not express anything about the art of the Bloomsbury Group and uh, of a philosophical impetus or a philosophical project. So here on the, on the slide, 
um, you see a lot about uh, understanding and about experience and about the, the intimacy one has to have with difficulties, paradoxes, mysteries of the subject. Like all of this happens, these eventful uh, um, kind of uh, things happen alongside the possibility of uh, creating facts. The one thing we should not do is uh, project factual statements back onto events because then we make that narrowing, uh, that, that, that movement of narrowing down um, that she is uh, critical about. Um, she says that we should not mistake particular facts for events. In Langer's view, durational events may produce many facts with accompanying space and time coordinates and specific subject, predicate, so relational structures. But ontologically prior, according to her, is the multiplicitous event. Importantly, and this is also um, uh, uh, how Langer discusses what we have later come to understand as paradigm shifts in the production of knowledge. An event in knowledge production as um, idea formation is prior and multiplicitous. So she thinks, and here you can, this you can see on the slide, she thinks about events as a, ma as, as, as a matrix giving rise to atomic propositions. So events are productive, uh, they, and they will remain productive. Uh, these atomic propositions uh, don't. They have specific space and time coordinates, uh, and, and we should make them um, explicit. She says, many relational structures may be derived from the same event. Okay, um, so I have read, uh, so this whole event logic uh, definitely suggests um, or gestures to the Whiteheadian uh, background uh, of um, Langer, and indeed uh, she did her PhD with, with Whitehead um, at Radcliffe College. Um, but I think we can also uh, read this um, with uh, Bergson and his virtual actual uh, coupling. Um, although Langer herself is quite critical of uh, Bergson, um, I think we should, uh, we should introduce a Bergsonian key or a Bergsonian, uh, uh, Bergsonian concepts to understanding what, to come to an understanding of what Langer wants to do. So uh, what is important, I think, in my view, is uh, that um, Langer uh, is critical of uh, the possible, the, this, this conceptual pair of the possible and the real, um, and happy to um, embrace the pair of the virtual and the actual. Um, she says that, you know, when you start from the real, a real, a fact, and project that upon uh, the possible, um, you actually, you will never be able to reach that ultimate uh, or that, that kind of, um, uh, the, the kind of, how do you say that, uh, productivity of events. So you immediately close down the productivity of events when you uh, start from something that has realized some itself uh, or something that has been realized, something that has very specific time and space coordinates. She says, you, by using these as your starting point, you will never be able to reach uh, a, a take on uh, transformation, on production, on duration. And with uh, the virtual and the actual, you can do that. Um, she, um, she was critical of Bergson. She says, she, she argued that he was a nonlinear thinker that was liked a little bit too much by artists. He was the artist's favorite philosopher uh, in, uh, during the time that uh, she was writing. Um, but at the same time, uh, she was producing a particular, an, an argument that comes very close to, to what, he, um, what he argues, uh, which is 
an, an, an argument also against an additive uh, logic. So she would say that um, just adding up particular fact one, particular fact two, particular fact, you know, up until the, the uh, you know, the nth uh, fact does not lead one to grasping a durational event. Um, it is, you have to start from this virtual durational event, the fact that the, the event that you cannot uh, really grasp yet, uh, and then um, try to find uh, the factual uh, or production uh, that is uh, imminent to it. Um, interesting, I think, is that Langer also calls facts perspectives, so specific perspectives, and she calls heterogene heterogeneity, so the heterogeneities, the multiplicitous heterogeneities uh, that are eventful, she calls them impartial. Um, so that is, I think, uh, a nice reversal. Um, so um, a factual statement, according to her, is not an impartial statement. That is a perspective, and it is the productive nature of events that is actually, uh, that we should consider as impartial. Um, yes. Um, then, let's go back to, um, so, so this was uh, like a more, uh, an, this, this, this is what I think the text on facts and the introduction of reflections on art uh, can produce. So, um, uh, which uh, is a take on um, fact and uh, event or entity and event uh, on uh, time space coordinates that are fixed, fixed and on uh, duration. Um, I think we can borrow these kinds of ideas uh, in order to understand what um, Langer, how Langer thinks about thinking in a way and about influence, uh, relations of influence in uh, creating a philosophical project. So let's look a little bit more closely at uh, this Reflections on Art source book itself. Um, how can we analyze this book in such a way that we grasp it as a durational event instead of as a set of particulars produced that must be added up? How can we grasp its philosophical impetus, its philosophical project, to refer back to some of these uh, earlier Langer quotes that are my source of inspiration uh, in the first place? First, uh, the particulars. Here you can see that uh, the text, or this book, uh, consists of some 30 uh, texts, and she also argues that uh, there are four particular texts, or she, she just not argues, she lists, she describes, that there are four particular texts, uh, the ones that are uh, on the right that she hasn't um, in included in the book because she says they're widely available. So she wants to... Um, uh, she, she was uh, brought up German, she spoke French, uh, so she also translated lots of European sources uh, in order to be included uh, in the book. Uh, and she wanted to make uh, these, all of these sources available for a wider audience, and apparently these four sources were uh, widely available uh, in the US at the time. Um, here you can see that uh, the contributors uh, only two women, uh, mostly um, men from the US that she lists, uh, some of them with a double nationality, um, but this is just information. Here you have, uh, I looked at like how this book was reviewed, and it was reviewed mainly negatively. Um, so all of Lang like lots of Langer's uh, work was uh, looked down upon, uh, was evaluated quite uh, negatively, but she herself was also very much of a negative uh, reviewer. So that it may also be, uh, you know, the, the a sign of the time or something. So um, when you read these reviews of reflections on art, uh, you see that, you know, uh, 
super gendered, so they consider uh, these texts that she uh, has brought together as psychological, sometimes even mystical. You see the last one, you know, frustrating, absurd, mysterious. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, some of the points that uh, the reviewers uh, write, uh, uh, like, in, uh, like bring up in a quite negative key, uh, Langer would happily agree with. So, for example, uh, this uh, person, Hodin, in, the ni in 1960, he wrote, In this age of ours, when true greatness is sometimes eclipsed by the ceaseless activities of innumerable specialized intellectuals, blah, 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 this is something that Langer would happily agree with. She would, she would also argue that there was way too much specialization going on uh, and that, uh, you know, we should actually be more playful with, with our sources. And at the end of her life, she was actually uh, trying to write um, a, a very interdisciplinary volume on mind that uh, brought together biology, neuroscience, da da da, and uh, artistic um, yeah, reflections on art. So um, she was a synth synthetical uh, thinker herself. Um, yes, uh, of course, there's also people that have written about Suzanne Langer uh, in uh, a positive way. Uh, and uh, these are, uh, and some of these uh, people I've reviewed, uh, referred to already, for example, Robert Innes, who wrote this uh, overview book on Suzanne Langer. Um, so, for example, um, he argues that it is, uh, it is a good thing that Langer wanted to undermine any temptation to remain committed to epistemology as we have known it. So an epistemology that was very much based on uh, reflections on fact, on positivism, on empiricism uh, in, in very naive uh, manners. Um, there's uh, Arabella Lyon, who's written a lot about Langer and also about like the gendered perception of Langer, who argues that uh, Langer was one of the first uh, scholars that um, wrote about about knowledge production in a as as a communal activity, including art, myth, ritual, but also science. Um, and, and also putting all of these uh, yeah, productions uh, on an equal level. And as uh, somebody that uh, had a focus on, on change. Um, most people have argued that Langer was not uh, an, an easy, um, was not embarking on the easiest of tasks, as uh, somebody who I also quote on this slide uh, argues. Um, but, uh, yeah, these reviewers consider that to be a good thing. Okay. So, I've given you now, I've done now two things. So, uh, I talk you through uh, Suzanne Langer's uh, way of uh, widening philosophy of science um, uh, in keeping with uh, the, the, the production of uh, philosophers of science. I don't think she is necessarily... Uh, critical. I think she gives uh, the work of philosoph philosophers of science their proper place. So the way in which she talks about fact is more like a making precise of uh, uh, the scholarship on fact, for example, um, and introducing like event uh, logic in a way uh, to this uh, community of, of scholarship. Um, um, yeah, helps, helps her to do that, and it also helps me in my project of understanding what she was doing. Um, I, like, quickly took you through uh, this Reflections on Art uh, book, um, because uh, I think it is a, um, yeah, how do you say that? Um, it is just one incarnation of uh, Langer bringing together several sources, and it's something that we can uh, yeah, that we can reflect on. Um, and now um, I want to uh, go back again to, to the question that I asked uh, in the beginning of, of my talk and also the, um, the relation that I see between Langer and um, 
like uh, what we are doing now uh, in uh, uh, our scholarship and what we see our students do uh, now that they are doing their um, their research in um, yeah an algorithmic condition let's say so my argument would be that or or maybe my proposal would be that Suzanne Langer's take on project and bibliography is best reached when we look at her work as procedural. So when we actually use what we now know about the algorithmic condition, which is a term that uh, I use together with uh, colleagues like Felicity Coleman, but also Vera Bullman. Um, and uh, yeah, I argue that for, for a particular uh, uh, reason. Um, that I will, um, that, that, that hopefully will come, become clear later. So what is a procedural thinking? A procedural thinking, and this is something that, uh, this is kind of like a, a little list of <laughs> what that could be uh, that I have uh, developed together with Nana Verhoef sitting over there, uh, which says that a procedural thought or a procedural thinking has uh, a couple of interlocking uh, characteristics, lived experience, uh, interaction between world and algorithm, intra-action of world and algorithm, and a contingent uh, computation. And that's a term by Beatrice Fazzi. I'm not necessarily fully in agreement with uh, how she conceptualizes contingent computation, but I like uh, the concept very much because of this notion of contingency, indeterminacy. So lived experience, of course, uh, and I think also in the previous talk by Amanda, we, uh, we were introduced to that, uh, is something that can only be understood uh, with in, its, uh, in its fullness uh, when we follow this event logic of uh, constant production of new, not only facts, uh, but also feeling, and also, uh, you know, textual and visual uh, production, for example. Um, that's, of course, part of uh, a procedural thinking, especially when we look at uh, Suzanne Langer. Then another element of a procedural uh, thinking would be um, in, in an algorithmic condition would be interaction between world and algorithm, which is uh, maybe a little bit clumsily formulated, um, but it is uh, the, um, the fact logic that, according to Langer, uh, is produced in events. So, and of course, when we look at this uh, in the, in the uh, algorithmic condition, interaction has everything to do with filter bubbles uh, that we heard uh, about yesterday, echo chambers uh, that, um, you know, uh, filter bubbles, you know, Facebook, et cetera, creating unity in one's new news feed, echo chambers, you know, one uh, brings her own um, interests to those feeds, um, uh, the, the idea that offline sexism, racism, homo homophobia, etc., feeds back into, uh, uh, you know, uh, algorithmic uh, production, etc. There's a replication of what is outside the computer, let's, uh, let's put it that way, um, in, um, to its inside, to its workings. Um, these are all, I would say, these are all true, but they're not enough uh, for a uh, like deep understanding of what procedural thinking could be. So this is why the, there's the third um, bullet point, intra-action of world and algor algorithm, a simultaneous coming into being of off and online production that we see these days. Um, just like the hybrid, or maybe even better, the multiplicitous life that we're all living. And then the fourth point, contingent computation, which I or we like for its suggestion of indeterminacy. 
So why do I need all this? Uh, and why do I find it uh, interesting, an interesting model for thinking about Suzanne Langer, which then I immediately have to say that, of course, my whole project is about using Langer also maybe as a model of, for thinking about um, the algorithmic condition, thinking uh, in the algorithmic condition. So earlier I referred to this profile sketch that was published in the New Yorker. And in this profile sketch, um, the um, journalist writes about Suzanne Langer's um, card system and reveals a lot about how she did her thinking. So I will read this. So it says, behind the scattering of papers is a large card index file in which she has recorded for many years references to philosophical, anthropological, um, uh, and psychological items she has discovered in books and also ideas of her own jotted down in moments of reflection. The moments are apt to occur at almost any time. She often thinks of a theory in the middle of the night and has developed an efficient technique for writing in the dark. She has also been known to stop her station wagon on the road to record an idea before it escapes her mind, and she remembers, one, remembers once doing this while she was on her way to the dentist with a toothache. The cards on which her own and other thinkers' ideas are preserved are methodically cross-indexed in a separate file so that she can instantly lay her hands on everything pertaining to a given subject. She is proud of the efficiency of her card indexing system, a sort of handmade mechanical memory that she has kept ever since her undergraduate days. I read somewhere that she had 18 boxes of thousands of cards. Um, her files contain some rather abstruse headings, for example, feeling primary to mental life, under which are to be found numerous entries, some of them references to her own thoughts, others references to or digests of books in English, French, and German that deal with the field. Mrs. Langer is a methodical scholar, and before launching any theory of her own, she will con consensually ransack the literature of the subject for support, carefully giving credit to her procur precursors. She uses her card index not only as a storehouse of reference, but also as a stimulation to thought. Many of her ideas have arisen suddenly from the fortitious congruence of notions she has come upon while leafing through it. Um, I was super happy when I found, <laughs> when I found this. Um, there's very little known uh, about Langer and about how she was working. Um, so uh, I've been speculating about uh, her um, way of bringing sources together for a couple of years now and finding this um, was helpful. I think her card index um, is, uh, you know, written about uh, in a way that does justice to this event logic, this fact logic or entity logic that I talked about before uh, when you follow this journalist. So the journalist talks about a mechanical memory, we all know this metaphor, a methodical cross, he describes it as a methodical cross-indexing system. Of course, we don't know uh, which words are Langer's or which ones are his. Uh, everything on a subject can be found in an instance, so the spatial and temporal elements are there. Uh, the cards are a storehouse of reference and a stimulation to thought. And uh, importantly, um, what uh, also uh, is discussed in this quote is that uh, leafing through the card index um, may uh, bring uh, like um, surprising ideas in a way, may uh, generate surprising uh, ideas. And um, I think this is very much what uh, we are now also experiencing uh, and what our students are experiencing uh, now that we are writing uh, so much uh, um, outside canonical renderings because basically uh, uh, 
algorithmically, in a way, uh, we can find uh, or we are presented with uh, so many sources um, at the same time. Um, and, uh, um, you know, Web of Science, Google Scholar, or Google in the first place is google.com, not scholar.google.com. They, uh, they generate um, uh, not only um, uh, yeah, hierarchical, they don't uh, only present uh, hierarchical, canonical um, uh, yeah, sources, uh, but also uh, there's a more horizontal and non-canonical cartographical uh, presentation of, of sources. And, and, you know, the distance between uh, sources um, are no longer, um, how do you say that, um, are no longer um, generated by uh, canonical uh, by a canonical take on, on text and image, uh, but uh, this, is, this is now also uh, done differently. Um, let me go through this PowerPoint. Um, yes, so back to, back to this book. Um, and back to the philosophy of science uh, as a conclusion. Uh, to this uh, to this presentation, so philosophy of science um, talks very negatively about uh, using textbooks for uh, reflection on um, scholarship, and uh, this this negative take on um, uh, yeah on on using textbooks uh, comes from. Um, what we call in the philosophy of science uh, the empirical turn in the philosophy of science. So when you look at um, how philosophy of science has developed, it has has developed over time. Uh, you see that um, after uh, logical positivism, let's say, there was the historical turn, the empirical turn, and uh, what I would say is that nowadays. Uh, we should uh, together develop uh, or invest in developing a more speculative turn in the philosophy of science. So philosophy of science in Suzanne Langer's time, so um, around maybe the time of her writing this, this essay, Fact, um, borrowed from and produced very normative um, uh, ideas about, about knowledge production. It was basically sending uh, ideas about knowledge to scholars, and it was not necessarily or not at all like reflecting back upon its own uh, practice. So here I said normative registers from a priorism to, to logical empiricism. Um, we all know that uh, in the 60s, uh, Thomas Kuhn changed this landscape of, of thinking about knowledge uh, in fundamental ways uh, with his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Um, and this is actually something that uh, I think when you take, uh, when you read Langer, uh, that she has also been uh, writing about already. So uh, Kuhn basically said that, you know, there is, there is, there is no, uh, we should leave progress narrative about knowledge production behind because knowledge develops itself according to a set of paradigms that do not have anything to do with one another, that don't speak to one another, that uh, you know you cannot translate concepts into each other's... Um, uh, yeah, you cannot translate uh, a concept of paradigm one into paradigm two. There is this fundamental disjunction between them. So that was his um, idea. Um, and uh, in between paradigms, there's, um, you know, uh, an, an ultimate, or there's a production of, of puzzles, as he says, uh, scientific revolution, and then there's a new paradigm. Um, so I think uh, this is something that, that Langer has uh, already, that Langer foresaw. Uh, Philosophy in a New Key was written in 42, uh, in which uh, she says, here, this is just a quote, and then came the unanswerable puzzles, the paradoxes that always mark the limit of what a generative idea, an intellectual vision uh, will do. And 
she also argues that you know new paradigms, or she calls them Weltanschauungen, um, uh, are uh, created when we become familiar with the new idea then it's unbalanced popularity is over, we settle down to the problems that it has generated, and these become the characteristic issues of our time. Um, so what this historical turn is doing is um, researching textbooks, uh, that is what Kuhn was doing, or, or researching the ways in which the scholarship of a particular era was translated to uh, students, for example, that had to be initiated. And uh, this whole idea was overturned turned in a way by Latour in uh, 87, or uh, that was when he published uh, Science in Action. Um, and Latour said that uh, by uh, reflecting on textbooks, you will actually never get uh, uh, a, uh, an idea of uh, what um, scholars in a particular era were doing. Um, so um, he made that move in Science in Action, that's the second bullet point, um, from studying what established scientists say they do to what scientists do. And I think that uh, also Suzanne Langer has uh, foreseen a little bit of this. So uh, she said, for example, in Feeling and Form, just as the most interesting philosophy of science has been developed to meet the logical problems of the laboratory, so the most vital issues in philosophy of art stem from the studio. So we can rewrite the Latour quote from studying what established artists say they do to making this move to studying what artists do. Uh, but this very descriptive, so what, what the empirical turn in the philosophy of science generated is a very descriptive take on uh, knowledge production, so producing uh, descriptions, facts uh, about uh, yeah, knowledge production or, or idea formation or maybe even the making of art. Um, and uh, we have seen that uh, for Langer, this factual production is a narrowing down. So uh, what I would say is that uh, we need some sort of more speculative take on uh, what knowledge production is. Uh, maybe, and that was just my, my proposal here, uh, by using um, uh, a particular interpretation of what a procedural thought may be, uh, for our, um, yeah, as, as a model uh, for how we uh, do our thinking these days. Um, and again, you know, I think Langer uh, is, um, is a good example uh, for, for that. Um, yes, uh, so I, I think I will just... Uh, leave it at that and uh, not even show you my clumsy uh, slide. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. You already have one question. Thanks so much for that. I really uh, enjoyed the talk. I'm not that familiar with Langer and I, so, um, this idea that we're all doing the same philosophy, I also found quite compelling. And it struck me that it is, in some ways, this representation of one's relationship as a part to the whole. And within your talk, there was a moment that I just wanted to identify where the part um, really captured the whole. And it's in this idea of writing in the dark. Um, so in three ways then, there's this writing in the dark, which is the literal um, sort of thing that she did, but also writing in the dark as a woman in philosophy, and writing in the dark um, being somehow unaware of, or this fundamental way that when one writes philosophy, one doesn't know <laughs> what everyone else has said. You know, that you're in the dark in a, in a very constitutive way but that darkness puts you in relationship to something that you can say, that there's a resonance, that you're writing with people somehow, 
or your work is resonating with others, even when you don't know it. And this idea of resonance I found interesting because there was, in one of your slides that you know, showed that um, she read Little Women and read Kant at the same time, um, there was a part that you crossed out, which was that she played the piano. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that there might be some tools there, and maybe in line with this idea of harmonics, resonance, um, for uh, explaining and, and thinking more in this idea of what the, um, this kind of procedural thinking is that you're articulating. And so I found it really exciting, and I don't know if, if that's really a question, it's just more um, It's a sign of eloquence, as I said before. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't really have anything to add to that. I think uh, you, you produced, uh, you know, you, you produced a, a very nice uh, insight, like opening up this, this writing, writing in a dark kind of like uh, method that, that Langer uh, also, also used. And, and, you know, I don't know, I have nothing to add to that. I'd, well, I'd, I'd, thank you for introducing me to, to Langer. I'd, literally, this is the first I, I've heard. Um, and th they're all kind of tantalizing suggestions of the influences that um, uh, uh, you mentioned. I think, I think what I'm most interested in uh, 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 is, is your topic of speculation. Because... Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. So somebody, somebody familiar with um, contemporary continental philosophy m might expect a, a talk about uh, speculative realism in, in in this context. And it seems to me that you, you're precisely not really the, the speculation you're talking about, which which is Langer's. You're not really making the connection with speculative realism. We we don't see in the list that you included among speculative thinkers. We don't find. Mayasu or Graham Harmon, and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'd be interested then to push you a bit more on what, on, I, I, we didn't, what we didn't get, maybe what we shouldn't expect, perhaps, is, is a definition of specula speculative, what speculation is. But I'd be interested to have a sense, maybe, that, that speculation might be simply the commitment not to reduce to fact. And I wonder if that is a good enough definition that, that, that we, we, we might, might take away from the, the talk. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, at, at, at some point I just ended. Uh, this also has something to do with this ticking clock that I found on my, uh, on my, on my laptop here. So I was like, ah, uh, I don't want to talk more. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I showed you this, uh, this list, the more historical take on like how um, yeah, philosophy of science has, has developed. And of course, this, this historical take is, is not, not that interesting. Uh, it's, it's just a list, you know, whatever. We, it's a teaching tool. And, you know, the minute you teach it, you know, students start already make, they, they, they make different connections. They find uh, links between the terms. And so uh, I basically uh, looked at or try to restructure uh, this, this thinking about uh, the development of uh, philosophy of science uh, in, in an alternative way, and here it becomes clumsy, um, but it may give you some sort of idea of, of what I understand with uh, speculation here. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, should, it goes should, a little bit we, too far to... Sh should we just leave it empty then? Is, is that the... Well, that I mean, uh, here I wrote, for example, that, you know, when you combine uh, a more historical take on uh, knowledge production with uh, a speculative take, uh, you know, you, you, enter, uh, you, 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 you enter the realm of a Leotardian rewriting, you know, which, uh, you know, which is... Uh, this this idea that um, uh, that it is that post modernity, for example, is included in uh, modernity. The idea that there there the minute you define 
modernity uh, as, as an artistic movement, uh, but also more epistemologically, that there's, there's already like your definition uh, is like it's never good enough. So there's, there's always something more that, that you also want to say. So, you know, that's, that's what Leo Tarr is talking about. Uh, you know, the, the idea of, of diffractive reading. So if, if you read diffractively, so if you read sources that do have a particular uh, place in, uh, or a particular uh, location in, in time and, and, and space, uh, but, you know, these, these locations are different when you read them through one another. You, you're also, you're, you're doing also two things at the same time. You're both locating the source and, and arguing that we should read it uh, differently, that there's, there's resonance happening between uh, or across uh, the canon. Um, and, uh, you know, here uh, on the intersection of uh, empirical philosophies of science and, and more speculative takes, you know, I simply wrote here now, uh, you know, speculative sociology of knowledge. There's, there's lots of people writing about, uh, you know, okay, so we, we can list, for example, uh, what uh, all kinds of um, technological devices do uh, to our, uh, or we can group uh, how the, way, the ways in which we think about what technological devices do to our knowledge production. Uh, and, and push all of these groupings to the limit. Uh, so, so that would be for me like a more speculative, uh, uh, speculative sociology of knowledge. Um, an alternative, uh, I, I also tried, and, and these are just attempts at, at trying to think differently about, uh, about philosophy of science with, uh, you know, knowing uh, that, that now, you know, we're also thinking about speculation. Um, the breaks and ruptures of Thomas Kuhn are situated on the intersection of, uh, but also of Foucault, uh, situated on the intersection of normative and historical uh, take on knowledge production. Uh, speculation here would be, uh, you know, um, the Bergsonian virtual and, and, and actual, the idea that, uh, you know, we, we should go event logic uh, and uh, like accept the fact that events will always be uh, productive. Uh, I think Amanda, you said something about like revolutions, they're never, what did you say? You said something, they're always disappointing, but uh, you know that, that disappointment is also a source of like a constant revisiting. So, so the, these are some of the things that I'm that I'm thinking about uh, when I think about uh, speculation. I don't go speculative realism because I think a speculative realism is a movement uh, that uh, borrows way too much from the normative uh, register. So, I mean, uh, sending ideas about knowledge production to, you know, whoever wants to read it. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, what, th 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 these thinkers don't, don't situate themselves, uh, I think. So th I don't know, maybe that's an answer to your question, but set of reflections, maybe. Indeed, it, indeed, indeed. Um, and, and actually, I agree with you. I, I, don't, I don't really see, I've yet really to f find the great use of, of speculative realism. I, I don't really get what they're doing. There's or, or a suggestion, I think there's a suggestion that, that <coughs> you know, their thinking can be picked up, but yeah, some, some, some artists are inspired by, by their writings, uh, but I think, yeah, I, I don't really see a great use in, uh, for the reflection on knowledge, because, because it's, it's unsituated itself, so. Yeah. And actually, not very scientifically literate, mostly, I would say. <laughs> I'll leave it with you, yeah. Someone else? Um, I have a question uh, about I mean, the, the, the notion of diffractive reading, which I thought was really, really fascinating. But I guess my, my question is less, I mean, is more, more in terms of um, how 
how one can actually practice a diffractive reading in a manner that sort of upsets, let's say, a hierarchical tendency that's almost inevitable in the sense that you're challenging, let's say, at least in terms of the very beginning of the paper, um, the set of like influences of the way in which Langer has been situated and wanting to reposition her in terms of, um, say, Bergson and Whitehead. But then sort of going back to that earlier passage where she's reading Kant and, uh, and Little, Little Women. Women, which I thought was, I mean, just really incredible. I mean, in the sense and what it would mean then to, to reposition then her philosophical work, for example, if she's her, let's say, elements of Kantianism that would have to be read in conjunction with pairing it to Little Women. In other words, rather than it just being about a way of resituating her philosophical trajectory. But what I found interesting about this notion of diffraction, but also even the, the book that was that she put together as an edited set, which was very eclectic and, and peculiar in, in the way in which she wanted to construct like a, a kind of assemblage of, of thinking about art, um, would be what does it mean to sort of dismantle the, the tendency that would be to, to give a philosophical reading of a philosopher and to diffract the philosophy through these very eclectic sources, which would be then a non-philosophical reflection of the philosophy. Do you, do you see the question there? Because mm. it's, it's hard not to then reposition her philosophy by privileging philosophy and not then thinking, what does it mean to read Kant and Little Women? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. How does that change one's reading of Kant? Rather than it just being two things that she's reading at the same time. Well, I, I think what you're what you're suggesting, and, and, and it is also true, is that in this presentation, I didn't do a defective reading in a way. I basically just hinted at it and and said that uh, you know this this that method uh, is an interesting method for reading Langer, but I didn't do it. I mean, this this would be a perfect uh, project, and and also like the defective reading that I performed was just like reading Langer through Langer in a way, like the. 1933 text read, read through the 1958 text. Um, I, I haven't I haven't followed this up. Uh, I, I think somebody should do it. <laughs> somebody should do it, and and I would be very interested in in in, in what comes out of it. Uh, the only thing that I know for a fact is that lists like this uh, don't do justice to uh, Langer's work. Uh, this, you know. Uh, yeah, what, what, what can you, I mean, just a chapter, it's also like a chapter on Langer and Schaeffer, Langer and Kassir, Langer and Whitehead. It's not enough for me. But I haven't, I haven't followed this up. I hope someone will. That's the only thing I can say. I think my question relates. I went, you had on one slide, just as a, as a neben by, you had, Langer was thinking differently about proper names. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah, it's. Um, I also I also thought about about that uh, uh, during Amanda's presentation and your uh, this. Uh, so where is it? Um, yes, unanalyzed uh, proper names. So. Um, this has something to do with her take on Wittgenstein. So she basically, uh, she read the Tractatus differently and argued that, you know, where Wittgenstein says we have to, we have to stop our analysis and cannot, cannot continue. She said, we have to continue. And, you know, this is what, this is why I'm trying to write a philosophy of art. And this is why I'm trying to reflect on a different, uh, a different form of expression. And for her, making this statement was not a statement against Wittgenstein. It's, uh, she would just simply extend, that's what she would say, I'm extending uh, his work. I think so, this is a, that's an, I th so because it portrays so nicely in between your two papers, no, you have with Lacan, you have this emphasis on law and this phallic signifier and, 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 and only there's only the name of the father. The other distinction between proper names is not addressed. And here it's the idea of, yeah, 
how to introduce genealogies um, which do not determine us, but, or not only, no? which we can circuitously inform at the same mm -hmm. time. And to turn around the um, uh, proper names as unanalyzed, this is a kind of, uh, the chest, uh, yeah, I'm super fond of the gesture, of course, because it also means, it also means that you create, um, you create your heritage. No, no, you, you create your ancestry. So, and that might be a relation to the speculation that you are looking for. So if you, if you want a concept, a definition, or, a, or a, I would say a, an, um, a formalization of, uh, of what then this speculation would be doing, it would be uh, a manner of, through anticipation, creating where one will have, com will have been coming from, no? somehow. And then it keeps with this, um, huh? mm. yeah. Something like that. But the pr it's somehow the, these proper names are interesting, no? <laughs> and yeah, the well, there's, um, as I said, I've been, I've been working on, on this Langer project for a long time, and uh, I think it will also keep me busy for, for a, little <laughs> a little longer, because uh, there, are so many, there are so many aspects to this, and genealogy, but, but a very creative take on, on genealogy, that's, that's very much what, what this is all about for me. Like, look at this. What what is go what is going on here? You know, known or unknown to any particular thinker. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. More. So maybe I can close this up by a personal comment. Okay. Because um, uh, just to say, like I would find the presentation um, very nicely also as I was um, reading for a long time ago this feeling and form of Susan mm -hmm. Gellinger and I got very much inspired in my own profession by her saying that architects are working on space to be lived with. Yes. And I thought in your presentation I could connect with that and get new inspiration so thank oh, you very I much. I didn't even go